broadcast again. We're ready. Okay. And I am ready. Good morning. Welcome to the first webinar in our GIF webinar series. Today's presentation is Atoms for Peace, the Next Generation. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending so early in the morning, at least early in the morning where I'm at. Um, during today's introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Dr. Pavier is the Office Director of Systems Engineering and Integration at the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy, and she's also the Chair of the GIF Education and Training Task Force. Patricia? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Bertha, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our host, the Department of Homeland Security, which is hosting this seminar. I, want, uh, I would like to thank you for your interest in our first webinar series. It's organized by the Generation 4 International Forum, Education and Training Task Force. And work, I would like to thank all the members of this task force that make it possible. Over the coming year, we invite you to join us to a monthly webinar presentation, which will provide an introduction to new reactor design it will offer overviews of the various Generation 4 reactor concepts, and it will review as well nuclear fuel and materials and energy conversion. As of today, we are planning to have 13 webinars, so I invite you to come to us uh, every month and uh, until September 2017. It's my great pleasure to introduce you today to our first speaker, Dr. John Kelly who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Reactor Technologies in the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Nuclear Energy. His office is uh, responsible for the civilian nuclear reactor oh, yeah. research and development portfolio, which includes programs on small modular reactor, locked water reactor sustainability, and advanced generation for reactors. His office also is responsible for the design the development and the production of radioisotope power systems, principally for missions of the U.S. NASA. In the international arena, Dr. Kelly is the immediate past chair of the Gen4 International Former Forum and the former chair of the IAEA Standing Advisory Group on Nuclear Energy. Prior to joining the Department of Energy in 2010, Dr. Kelly spent 30 years at Sandia National Laboratories, where he was engaged in a broad spectrum of research programs in nuclear reactor safety, advanced nuclear energy technology, and national security. So Dr. Kelly received his BS degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan and his PhD in nuclear engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Without any further delay, I give you the floor, John, and I really thank you for volunteering to give this first webinar. Well, thank you, Patricia, and I want to welcome everyone to the inaugural Generation 4 Education and Training Webinar Series. Uh, the webinar series is uh, designed to provide the general public with information on the next generation of nuclear uh, power reactors, namely the Generation 4 reactors. In today's talk, I'm going to cover three main topics. <clears throat> First, give a little bit of a background on the Atoms for Peace initiative and how that led to the development of uh, civilian nuclear power around the world. I'll then talk about nuclear uh, reactor technology of today <clears throat> and then talk about the Generation 4, which is the technology of the future. So let's uh, go back to uh, 1953 when President Eisenhower made a very important speech at the United Nations. It, the speech is called the Atoms for Peace speech because in that speech he unveiled a new program to basically use nuclear power uh, for peaceful uses and to provide that technology to the whole world or anyone that was interested in using that technology provided that they used it for pe peaceful uses only. Um, this came at a time when the world only knew about nuclear power in, in, in the sense of uh, nuclear weapons. And so this basically was a game-changing uh, concept, to use nuclear power for uh, civilian peaceful uses. 
Now this was based on the discovery of, of fission in 1938 by Otto Hahn. And after that discovery, which was basically that the uranium atom, when hit by neutrons, would split into two pieces and uh, uh, emit addi additional neutrons. So when the fission occurs, the uranium atom splits, releases energy and neutrons. And the important thing about the uh, uh, neutrons, which are on average about two and a half neutrons per fission, is that those neutrons can in turn then strike other uranium nucleuses and lead to um, a chain reaction. And, then, and that is the basic principle for nuclear fission reactors. So in the nuclear reactor, the chain reaction is controlled so that the number of neutrons created by fission equals the number that are absorbed in either the fuel, control rods, and other materials. And so there's a, basically a constant neutron population, and we have a steady state operation. The laptop. Now after um, <clears throat> fission, there were a lot of experimental reactors that were put together. And this <clears throat> uh, tree here kind of shows the, the various designs that were created uh, after the uh, discussion, uh, discovery of fission with the, the first nuclear uh, reactor actually being uh, built by Enrico Fermi in uh, Chicago. And uh, basically there were several branches of the tree. Uh, one had to do with pressurized water reactor, another with a gas-cooled reactor, others with boiling water reactors, and then fast breeder reactors were another type of branch. So there were a set of experimental reactors that were uh, either uh, designed or designed and tested to prove the principles of these, re uh, of these uh, reactor concepts. That led then to the generation one reactors, the early prototypes. So around the world, we saw all of the different types of reactors being built at relatively small scale. Uh, and basically, these were showing the, the, not, not only the, the uh, safety principles, but also the uh, operational principles and all the things that one would need to consider in the operation of a nuclear reactor. So we had uh, uh, small, smaller scale reactors uh, being built in the UK, the US, Canada, uh, Europe, uh, Russia, et cetera. And so this let, was basically the, the first generation of reactors. After the uh, community had experience with that first generation, the reactors were scaled up. The smaller ones were maybe 50 megawatts electric. The, the next generation was more like 500 megawatt electric. And then growing to what we have today, which are basically the generation two reactors. So the reactors in operation today are termed Generation 2. They were initially a scale-up of the early prototypes. And then over time, they continued to grow in power output. Now, the basics of a nuclear power plant are shown here. As I mentioned before, when the uh, uranium atoms fission, they release energy. That energy creates, basically, heat. That heat is removed by the coolant. So in this case, I'm showing the schematic of a pressurized water reactor where there's coolant flow um, through the core here. And then that uh, removes the heat. The heat, the water is hot here, and then goes to what's called the steam generator. And so it's a second loop where the, this hot water transfers energy to the steam generator side, which generates steam. That steam then flows through the turbine, turning the turbine, the turbo generator, making electricity. It's then cooled comes back, and the water that's after going through the steam generator is cooled and then is recirculated through the core. So pretty, pretty basic, simple principles of how that works. Now, the uranium is actually encapsulated in a fuel pellet, uh, shown here, uh, relatively small, just a few centimeters. It weighs about seven grams. Those fuel pellets are stacked in fuel rods. That's what a fuel rod is right here. And then the fuel rods are put into assembly of various size. I think this is a 15 by 15 uh, 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 square array. The important thing here is the amount of energy content of that uranium. This is one of the reasons that uh, fission reactors are so desirable. It's equivalent to, in that pellet of 7 grams, 1,400 cubic meters of oil, or a metric ton of coal, or 480 cubic meters of natural gas. 
So a lot of energy in a very compact uh, air, uh, mass. And this means that nuclear power plants can be very high power density and relatively small. Now that, uh, back in the beginning, remember 53 is when Eisenhower made a speech and we began to see the early reactors under construction. This shows how the reactors in, around the world were being constructed and the number uh, that were under construction uh, in a given year. And what we see is that there was a massive wave. So the early discovery of fission leading to the early prototypes then led to this wave of reactors being constructed around the world. This slowed in the 90s. But today, we're now seeing an increase in the number of reactors in the world. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, uh, some of the reasons for that. <clears throat> but back in the, uh, the early 60s and through the 70s and 80s, there were several important drivers for that first wave of nuclear reactors. Uh, initially, the, the world was recovering from World War II, and the economies of the world needed energy and needed abundant energy and inexpensive energy, and nuclear was able to provide that. We had the uh, oil crisis of the 70s, where this alerted people to the importance of energy security. And all of the nuclear programs around the world had strong government backing. Um, at the same time, there were some discouraging drivers that <clears throat> maybe inhibited the growth of nuclear power. Uh, interest rates were high in the 70s and, and, and actually were uh, worldwide, and this led to the uh, uh, unavailability of capital, which was very important for nuclear power uh, plant uh, projects. Uh, people were afraid of radiation. There was a fear of nuclear weapons and an association of nuclear weapons with nuclear power. There were accidents at Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. And there were concerns about the nuclear waste that was created. And, and at that time, there were several, I would say, neutral drivers. People they didn't influence the development either way. <clears throat> But today, <clears throat> we see these as very important drivers. Uh, acid rain, this is produced from the, the sulfuric acids that are, are created during the combustion of coal. This can lead to the destruction of forests, uh, and uh, as shown in the picture there. Uh, air pollution and concerns about human health and the polluted air. And there was a study that came out in 1971 that talked about inadvertent climate modification, which basically pointed to the fact that CO2 and other gases could inadvertently modify the climate. And of course, today, this is a, of paramount importance to the entire world. Given that initial uh, beginnings of Adams for Peace and then the uh, beginning of the deployment, nuclear power went from basically nothing in 1953 to something on the order of about 14 or 15 percent of the world's electricity generation in a very short period of time. Very, very impressive. We see many countries, uh, US, others, had something on the order of about 20% production of their electricity from nuclear. Other countries, such as France, uh, were much higher up in the 70s. And then other countries, such as China and India, were relatively low in the 2 to 3% range. Um, and uh, what we will see in just a minute is that the, gro the major growth in nuclear is now occurring in Asia, where these countries, uh, you know, my belief, are trying to increase the amount of nuclear from something on the order of a few percent to something that's more common around the world in this, is this uh, 10, 20 percent type of range. Now, today, the drivers are different than they were in the 50s but they're equally important around the world in terms of motivating the development of nuclear power. First, energy security. So energy security <clears throat> um, basically is about having an energy supply that makes the country somewhat independent of imports. And so nuclear provides that opportunity for countries to shelter themselves from the import of costly fossil fuels. And as we see coal and nuclear plants that were developed in the 50s, 60s, et cetera, beginning to retire, nuclear power can be a source of replacement for that energy that's clean. There's economic incentives in some countries. Some nations are rich in fossil fuels. And then rather than using those to make electricity, they're deciding to uh, change uh, their electricity production to nuclear. There's also concerns about environmental protection, particularly air pollution. 
And with nuclear being clean, carbon-free emission, emission-free uh, electricity generation, countries can, can see this as a path forward to eliminate air pollution, and in addition, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emission, which is really now a worldwide concern. So nuclear is an emission-free baseload generation, and in some parts of the world where water is sore, scarce, nuclear power can use dry condenser cooling, which will very, especially in the case of small modular reactors, which will limit the amount of water required uh, for the production of the electricity. So today, uh, this chart here shows the plants under construction around the world, either planned or, or actually are happening. We see uh, something on the order of, uh, right now, about 439 uh, reactors operating in 30 countries. Uh, 69 reactors are under construction, 24 of those in China. 172 reactors planned in the next 10 years or so, and well, over 300 reactors proposed over the next 15 years. So again, I uh, look at this and I say we're on the second wave of Atoms for Peace. And let me now talk about a few countries and the examples that illustrate the drivers for today. So most of electricity in China is generated from fossil fuel, something like 73%, mostly coal. And again, nuclear is in this about, uh, right today, about 3% range. And many countries have gone to something on the order of about 20%. So if you kind of do the math, you see that China needs to have about a tenfold increase in the amount of nuclear power to get to that 20% range. That means going from something on the order of uh, 20 or so uh, reactors to something on the order of about 200 over the next uh, several, several decades. Currently, there's uh, 34 reactors in operation, 20 under, plus under construction, 100 and almost 180 planned. And the goal in China is by uh, 2020 to have 58 gigawatts of electricity, 150 by 2030, and much more by 2050. Now, China has been working with other nations to, in the development of their nuclear power program. So in this example, uh, China has been working uh, with uh, the, the U.S. company Westinghouse in the development of uh, AP-1000s. And we actually have uh, eight plants uh, under construction in the world, four in China, two at two different sites, and the same in the U.S., two at two different sites. And it's been very impressive, the, uh, the uh, construction projects and how information shared is being shared between the nations and the companies to really help uh, uh, keep the economics of nuclear competitive with other uh, sources. Now in the UK, which had uh, something on the order of 20% of their electricity being generated by nuclear, uh, they made the decision that as they retire and, and, and uh, the, the, their current fleet of reactors, that they would rebuild uh, nuclear power in their country, replacing that nuclear with like nuclear power. Uh, currently, there are uh, 15 reactors in the UK generating about 20%. Uh, half of those were retired by 2025, so we're beginning to see the nuclear construction projects uh, beginning in China, I mean in the UK, sorry. Um, and that by um, uh, uh, 2030 or so, they are planning to have 11 new reactors totaling about 16 gigawatts, basically replacing their current fleet and increasing the amount of nuclear by about 50 percent. And this investment is expected to save them quite a bit of money, something on the order of 15 billion pounds, over the next 15 year, or 40 years. And the third example is the United Arab Emirates, which is rich in fossil fuels. They've made the decision to, uh, to, to go nuclear. Uh, they're seeing a dramatic increase in uh, energy, principally driven by uh, water desalination needs uh, in, a, in this very arid part of the world. They're currently dependent on oil and gas for their uh, energy supply. And so they're looking to diversify. Public opinion in the Emirates is favorable for nuclear, has actually been growing over the last few years. And currently, four reactors are under construction uh, and with the first unit expected to come online in 2017. Now, along with the development of those, uh, what we term generation three reactors, the ones, for instance, I just spoke of in the Emirates and in China and in, in the UK, there's also been worldwide interest in small modular reactors. The first mention of these came quite a while ago in the early 1980s. 
the characteristic of these are that they're small. That means, uh, in our parlance, less than 300 megawatt electric and modular. Um, what's uh, interesting about this technology is it can be fabricated in a factory and then shipped to the site for installation. So it's that factory fabrication that can lead to economies of mass production and high quality, such as we see in automotive industry and aerospace industry. And the transportable means that they can be uh, sent to uh, locations not requiring massive uh, construction uh, forces. And the in interest in SMRs has been increasing dramatically since the early 2000s, and we're now seeing efforts to move towards commercialization of the technology. The benefits of SMRs, first, are safety benefits. The heat in the re from the reactor can, in some cases, be removed by natural circulation. That means they can operate without electricity to remove their, their plants, which is uh, their power, which is very important in, uh, uh, in certain accident scenarios. The design eliminates uh, some of the postulated accidents, uh, pipe breaks, for instance. Um, this greatly simplifies the design. They can be sited below grade, which can improve their seismic uh, uh, resistance and, and security posture. And all of these factors lead to the poten potential reduction in the emergency planning zone, which I think can really uh, help the public uh, uh, pre uh, appreciate and not fear nuclear power. That is, if the emergency planning zone is very small, uh, the public concern about it may, may diminish. There's also economic benefits. By having a smaller plant, it reduces the financial risk. Uh, utilities can add units over time. And uh, very important, at least in the US, is that the size of these plants is comparable to current coal plants. And so there's uh, a possibility of replacing ex existing coal as it retires with these small modular reactors and use the, the uh, existing infrastructure in terms of transmission lines rail lines, et cetera, for that small modular reactor. Now, globally, uh, SMRs are underdeveloped in, in many countries. Uh, in the US, there's four principal designs. Uh, these are integral pressurized water reactor designs by the companies I show here. Uh, Korea has a model. China has a couple of different concepts. One, a pressurized water reactor design. And the second one is a high temperature reactor, gas-cooled reactor. Argentina has a pressurized water uh, SMR under development. And Russia has been developing small floating nuclear power plants, uh, basically uh, using designs derived from their icebreaker uh, 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 ships and using those to, power, to provide power and heat for re remote areas in Russia. So as I began, I talked about the early prototypes. These led to the current generation, the large-scale systems of Generation 2. We're now seeing Generation 3 reactors being built around the world. And now let's move to the Generation 4. So back in uh, about the year 2000, uh, nine nations got together to form the Generation 4 International Forum. They evaluated well over 100 different reactor concepts and identified these six, sodium fast reactor, lead fast reactor, very high temperature reactor, gas cooled fast reactor, supercritical wa water cooled reactor, and molten salt reactor as being the most promising for uh, research, development, and deployment uh, by the 2050 timeframe uh, in, uh, in various countries in the world. And these reactors then were used to basically uh, provide the members of the Generation 4 with a framework for conducting R&D and sharing that information amongst themselves. Here are the GIF members uh, as of today. So we had the original uh, nine, and there were additional ones that have joined over time. We're now up to, I think, 14 members, with uh, Australia joining uh, signing the charter earlier this year and is now in the process of, uh, of uh, formally ratifying the uh, agreements that will be necessary for it to be a full partner within the Generation 4 program. The uh, interesting thing about the program is that each nation conducts research and that research is then shared amongst the other members. This gives a 
chart gives a, a picture of which countries are working on which reactors. Uh, and again, when the work is done, uh, reports are written, and these uh, technical reports are then shared among the other members. The interesting thing here is about the, uh, the two systems, the sodium fast reactor and the very high temperature reactor. We see that almost all of the, the GIF members are participating in those two systems. The other, and, and then which basically implies that these are the most mature systems, probably the first to be deployed uh, in terms of the Generation 4 technology. There are other Generation 4 technologies that are of less mature stature, uh, and we see a varying degree of interest in the world community in conducting R&D. But all of them have on the order, uh, have at least three members that are participating in the research on uh, that technology. Uh, I just will give a, a few highlights on each of the six systems. So the sodium fast reactor uh, basically features the use of sodium, which is a a metal, as a, a, but in liquid form as the coolant. The sodium will flow through the core, extract the heat, and then the heat is basically, a, a, in a similar way as I spoke about earlier, transmitted to, uh, to uh, 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 eventually to steam, which drives a turbine and the, the generator. Um, what's interesting about sodium is it's a, a low pressure coolant, so that we don't require very high pressure. So in a case of uh, uh, sodium, it, it operates, uh, sodium reactor, it operates at atmospheric pressure, whereas uh, the pressurized wa uh, water reactors op operate at very high pressure. And uh, it, uh, because of the nature of the uh, fission processes in the, in the sodium fast reactor, it's very flexible for uh, extending the uh, uranium utilization or into the destruction of nuclear waste. There's been over 400 years of experience in this technology in many countries around the world, and all of the GIF participants uh, have uh, active design uh, work in the sodium fast reactor. And I should add at this point that over the course of the next year, you'll be hearing a lot more detailed presentations on each of these systems. So the intent here was just to give you a highlight of those systems, and the, the subsequent uh, webinars will dive into the more details. Lead fast reactor, similar to sodium fast reactor, but it uses lead as the coolant. So it's molten lead, or in some case, a lead bismuth eutectic for operation. Uh, there's been uh, some experience, some good experience in, the, uh, in Russia in the submarine uh, effort on using the lead bismuth eutectic. And most of this, the uh, participants that are involved in the lead fast reactor work uh, have design activities going on. Gas fast reactor, very interesting concept. It uses helium as the coolant. It's very high temperature. It's very high pressure. Uh, there's been no operating experience of this technology, so it's one of the, the least, least mature of the Gen 4 uh, technologies. But if we can successfully pull it off, it has uh, some uh, very distinct advantages. The high temperature, up to 850 degrees C, means that it can be a very efficient system for electricity production, or alternatively, can be used in various industrial process heat applications. Very high temperature reactor is a, 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 a very popular around the world, and we see many nations uh, moving forward on that. In particular, China is developing the uh, first uh, demonstration of a uh, generation four at a significant scale. Uh, it features helium as a coolant, uses a special fuel that uh, retains the fission products that are generated. Uh, it's exceptionally safe, basically walk-away safe, that, that, that uh, uh, in, in the case of uh, various uh, accidents, uh, no operator interaction is needed to uh, basically bring the reactor to a safe condition. Again, the high temperature operation makes electricity production efficient and it enables non-electric operations. There's been significant worldwide experience uh, in this technology in Europe, uh, Asia, and the United States. And most of the, the countries um, uh, have, uh, that are involved in the system have uh, design activities ongoing. Um, <clears throat> the next is the molten salt uh, reactor. Uh, this uses a salt as the coolant, a liquid salt. It enables high temperature operation. Uh, it can operate either in a thermal or fast spectrum. Um, and it can operate with either molten fuel or solid fuel. And it has the opportunity for online uh, waste management. So a lot of uh, interesting features of the molten salt reactor. Uh, 
I guess, unfortunately, the experience on this has been very limited, with only experiments having been conducted back in the 60s. Um, but we see a lot of interest in this technology worldwide, and most of the participants have design uh, activities ongoing today. And finally is the supercritical water reactor. This is basically uh, a merging of light water reactor and pressurized heavy water reactor technology combined with advanced supercritical water technology that's used in coal plants. Uh, when we talk about supercritical fluids, this means that they're above the critical point, uh, which is a pressure and temperature for, for fluids, uh, at, at which point the, um, the uh, supercritical fluid is neither a, a liquid or a vapor. It's basically called a supercritical uh, fluid at that point. For water, the temperature is 374 degrees centigrade, 22 megapascals. So reactors that operate with uh, water at, at temperatures above 374 and pressures above 22.1 megapascals are operating with a supercritical fl uh, fluid. The reactor can operate in both fast and thermal spectrum. Uh, there's been no uh, experience with this uh, but uh, in terms of a nuclear reactor, but there's been vast experience with supercritical uh, water in the coal uh, power plants. Uh, efforts on this have been around for a long time, for nearly 50 years, They're dating back to the 1950s, uh, and there's preconceptual design activities uh, by system participants today. Now, while there are design activities, there are also uh, prototypes being uh, constructed around the world. Uh, in China, they have uh, various reactors of the Generation 4, uh, various sizes, uh, either in operation or under construction. They're currently operating a 20 megawatt fast reactor called the Chinese Experimental Fast Reactor. Uh, they're going to scale that up, and, and uh, there's a design activity for the Chinese prototype fast reactor. Currently, there's construction of a 200 megawatt uh, pebble bed high temperature gas reactor. This reactor is scheduled to uh, start electricity by the end of 2017. And the picture over here on the right shows uh, the first concrete being poured, which is now several years ago. And there's also work in China on a, a molten salt reactor. Uh, the term for it here is a, a fluoride salt cooled reactor. Uh, and that's a, a, a basically in the design effort uh, today. In Russia, uh, there's been great interest in sodium fast reactor. They recently completed the BN800, which started up this year. Uh, the next scale up of this will go to the BN1200, which is, in, in many people's view, the first uh, real Gen 4 uh, sodium fast reactor, and the goal of this uh, scale up is to make it competitive with light water reactors. Uh, Russia also has a test reactor, currently the Bohr 60, and they're designing and constructing a new test reactor called MBIR, and they're also looking at demonstration projects of a lead fast reactor, uh, uh, and that currently is ongoing. So in summary, Looking back, we saw that the first wave of reactors were driven by post-war economic growth in the industrialized world, concerns about energy supply and security, and they all had strong government support. Very important factors uh, in the beginning. Today, we see nuclear power on its second wave. And I would say that today, the interest in nuclear power is as strong as it was uh, back in the 50s. Uh, the reactor. Uh, Designs have evolved over time, becoming safer, more reliable, and more economic. So the nuclear industry has always been very cognizant of the need for safety, economics, and reliability. And over time, the reactors have evolved to meet those needs. And we're now looking at the Generation 4 reactors, which have the opportunity to be even more safe than the current generation, more economic, uh, better use of, uh, of uranium, less waste, other very desirable attributes. And they're progressing from the R&D stage to the deployment. And we're going to be able to see at least the demonstration uh, of Generation 4 in the not too distant future. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their attention. Just to highlight at the last slide here that we have uh, uh, webinars planned uh, right now for the uh, uh, next several months. Uh, the full schedule will be, is being developed, but we have the schedule locked in for November, uh, uh, where uh, Dr. Renault will talk about uh, introduction to nuclear reactor design. And then in December, uh, Dr. Hill will talk about sodium.
cooled fast reactors. So with that, let me see if I can figure out how to get to the questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Again, if you have questions for, um, for Dr. Keller ba based on today's presentation, there is a Q&A pod. You can just simply type in there, and those questions will be addressed um, as we have time for. Today's presentation was recorded, is being recorded. The slide deck is available um, right there in the pod below it, presentation slides. If you click that title, they will download. You can download those. Um, those slides will also be posted along with the recording of today's presentation um, and accessible from the GIF website. And the link there is in the answer to, that, to the question. Um, just give us a few days to get that information uploaded. So with that, um, and Bertha, if you could remind the people to take the survey, that oh. would be so nice and so helpful. Absolutely. And there is, in the notes pod down below, um, there is the link for the online survey. Um, it's just short, five or six questions, electronic. Um, we do appreciate your feedback. We take your feedback very seriously um, and look for opportunities for improvement. So that's very much appreciated. Dr. Kelly, can you see the, the questions coming in? Um, the first one is, do the countries with emerging interest in nuclear, e.g. Vietnam, Kenya, interact with the GIF to understand the potential of advanced nuclear? I'm not seeing those questions, so I must be on the On the, the Q&A pod, at the top there are two tabs. One is a presenter view and one is a participant view. And if you click, I got it. Uh, yep. there you go. Okay, so the first question had to do with uh, do we have interactions with, uh, are the newcomers interacting with uh, GIF? Uh, we don't have direct interactions, but we reach out through the International Atomic Energy Agency. We have many uh, of our GIF systems are uh, under uh, re review uh, through the IAEA. So all the members including uh, of IAEA, including Vietnam and Kenya, for instance, uh, can participate in those information sharing meetings that we have via IAEA. Uh, what is the cost of electricity uh, with the fast reactors? Uh, I, I don't have the, uh, uh, those numbers handy, but uh, the idea is to become cost competitive uh, with the uh, current day uh, nuclear, which is, uh, uh, depending on where you are, can be in, in the low uh, four cents per kilowatt hour, uh, that's in U.S. dollars, up to uh, something on the order of, of uh, maybe uh, eight for new construction, so in that range. Uh, does the fa does the Gen 4 need to be better? Uh, I think the Gen 4 reactors offer uh, additional value propositions uh, in terms of uh, h higher temperature for other uh, carbon-free uh, applications and the ability to manage the waste more effectively. And all these things have value. Um, what are the largest regulatory hurdles for uh, advanced reactors? Well, clearly the world has become very familiar with light water reactor and heavy water reactor technologies. And the regulators uh, basically regulate with their knowledge of that existing technology. So the hurdles that we have is helping the regulators uh, begin to understand and appreciate and get into the technical depth of, uh, of uh, advanced reactor technologies to generation four. We have several efforts meeting with the regulators to share that information. We have uh, workshops. Uh, and then formal interactions through the Nuclear Energy Agency to uh, really help explain the Generation 4 technology and encourage the regulators to take the time to learn more about it. Uh, how is IAEA involved in the development of Generation 4? Uh, IAEA is not directly involved in the development, but they do order, uh, offer the opportunity for information exchange. So they conduct uh, workshops, uh, various meetings, where uh, participants from the Generation 4 programs uh, go and provide information to the IAEA members about the status of the technology. Um, how does DOE NE view the viability of the development of Gen 4 lead fast reactors? And which design has elicited NE's uh, interest? Um, I think the lead fast reactors uh, are an interesting technology. Uh, I think uh, based on uh, maturity and ex experience, the sodium fast reactors uh, are higher at this point in time. But that doesn't rule out that in the future that lead fast reactors might be a, a very interesting technology. Um, 
in terms of uh, what our, our, our program currently today is that we've, we focused on high temperature reactors for electricity and process heat applications. So that's either a gas cooled or a molten salt cooled are the, um, uh, the, the two different technologies that we've been investing in. And then we've been investing in the sodium fast reactor uh, for high temperature and the opportunity to uh, uh, serve a waste management role. So what's the biggest uh, hurdle to um, uh, additional nuclear growth? Well, it depends on where you are. Um, I think in China and uh, India, we're, the, there's likely going to be a, a tenfold increase, in, in, and that's being driven uh, by the importance of having clean energy, pollution-free energy. These are very important attributes in some countries. In other countries that uh, have uh, abundant uh, fossil energies, for instance, the United States, uh, there is a view that there needs to be a value for carbon, uh, for carbon-free electricity. Uh, this is being talked about in various forums, but if the trade-off is between burning fossil fuels that are relatively cheap in some parts of the world uh, and creating then the possibility of gli climate change, uh, how, how, do, how does the, the world or the nation value uh, clean power? And so I think in some places, clean power and the valuing of that is going to be important. In others, it's to provide uh, uh, basically, uh, environmental protection for the nation. So I think uh, the qu next question is why is there research needed in uh, a sodium fast reactor when we've already seen some commercial demonstrations in, in France and the U.S. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the point is the here that the uh, we need to uh, basically improve the technology. So while it's been developed, we need to move towards even more advanced systems, principally working on the economics. So we understand how the physics, the thermal, hydraulics, the other aspects of the system work, but getting the economics uh, more efficient and improving the safety at the same time are two very important uh, uh, reasons that we're, the research is being conducted today. Yeah, so as the temperature index has to do about the, uh, are the proposed systems more efficient in the conversion of the thermal to uh, Power, uh, thermal output to electricity. Uh, the, uh, the answer here is uh, absolutely less. You'll see that most of the systems, most of the reasons for going to non-water systems is that we can increase the temperature uh, of, the, of the reactor from, uh, in some cases, 500 all the way up to 1,000 degrees centigrade. Uh, as you increase the, the temperature, the uh, efficiency of the thermal to electricity uh, production increases, or the, the, the electricity to thermal increases, uh, and can go from something on the order of 33 percent, perhaps as high as 50 percent of the thermal energy being converted to electricity. Okay, so how does DOE get involved in other designs that were not explicitly mentioned during the U.S. category? So the U.S. Uh, does participate as an observer in the other systems. So we have uh, assigned uh, experts that uh, go to the go to the go to the meetings and report back on the other systems. There's interest in all of those systems, uh, probably except for the supercritical water, uh, in, in, in various uh, sectors of the, the U.S. And so we basically work with our companies that are interested in those technologies uh, to also uh, uh, keep abreast of what's going on in those and are, are, are trying to solicit input from those companies on their research and development needs. Uh, what are the specific parameters which uh, make a reactor generation four? I think uh, basically we've set goals, in, and I uh, don't have them right. In front, I don't have the, the detailed metrics in front of me, but basically there's goals around economics, uh, making it uh, uh, cost competitive, around um, safety, and there are certain uh, uh, realization that we need to continue to improve the safety of the use of nuclear power. There's goals around. Uh, proliferation and security risks, uh, and how do we minimize those? And then there's goals around waste management. How do we reduce the amount of nuclear waste that is generated per, uh, let's say, kilowatt hour of electricity produced? Um, why have thermal reactors? Why are thermal reactors part of Generation 4 systems? I think there's a view that while uh, uh, 
producing clean electricity is very important. There's also a lot of fossil fuels consumed in industrial applications, such as petrochemical, manufacturing of cement, fertilizers. So some of the uh, high temperature, uh, so the, the reason for one of the high, for going to the high temperature is to be able to use those systems coupled with industrial processes so that those industrial processes can also be carbon free. Now in the case of the high temperature gas reactor, the fuel is a very special design which allows it to go to extremely high burn ups, which means we very, very uh, large utilization of the uranium. So the amount of, uh, of waste generated per unit of electricity generated is very small. So then the question has to do with safety regulations and, and, and harmonization. So uh, within generation four, we, we recognize the, the importance of setting uh, safety standards that are uh, in some sense um, uh, uniform across the country. So within the, within the program, we have been developing safety design criteria for the designers. And this is basically uh, getting input from all of the members, uh, patterning this uh, work after international standards that can be found at IAEA, but tailoring them to the generation four. This is sort of the first step to get at least our de designers within the program all working toward the same uh, safety goals and safety standards. Um, in the future, and currently it's ongoing, we're working with the regulators and trying to uh, do harmonization with them on the, um, the uh, uh, regulations for advanced reactors. What are the key innovations of uh, SFRs, yeah, you'll hear more about that, I think, in the, the talk that uh, Dr. Hill will, will present in December. Uh, I think uh, some of the things that I know we've been we've been working on are are techniques to uh, basically you know, inspect the inspect the vessel uh, online. Uh, that means not having to uh, go in. This this allows us to uh, basically improve and reduce the operational costs uh, associated with uh, uh, a sodium fast reactor. Been a lot of work on core design to basically limit and eliminate the possibility of uh, a certain class of accidents. Uh, and um, I think there, if you look through it, there's a ho host of other lessons learned uh, about the importance of the balance of plant, uh, limiting the, the possibility of interaction of the sodium with either air or water. These have all been important things that have uh, come about uh, in the design of the Generation 4 system. Several companies are pursuing uh, molten salt. Why wasn't this included on your table for USA? Well, when I talked about the USA, that has to do with the Department of Energy uh, R&D. And in fact, uh, we have been supporting companies in the US on molten salt uh, technology. Uh, we currently uh, are an observer to the molten salt uh, program. Uh, and as uh, the interest in this technology increases, and our R&D investments increase, uh, we may uh, reconsider uh, and uh, actually join uh, the molten salt uh, design. Now, thorium is a, a derivative of that technology. Again, the, uh, there's lots of, ver in every one of the, every case of the Generation 4 system, there are various designs. And so uh, that's not to say that the one that's shown there excludes thorium. Thorium is basically a subset of that. So the question is, how does uh, Generation 4 fit with the renewables? Um, I think the uh, important thing about the uh, uh, integration of the, the grid, with it's, it's not just nuclear, but it's with baseload power. And this is something that is an active area of, of research. There's several ways of, of thinking about this. There's uh, a possibility of, of uh, improved uh, storage technology that would then allow the intermittent renewables uh, not to really uh, cause uh, uh, reliability issues with the grid. I think another uh, thing is if uh, the nuclear plants could be more load following. Uh, but I think what uh, a lot of people are looking at is can, can nuclear be uh, used to generate other valuable energy products, such as hydrogen or process heat? 
that then can uh, basically uh, be used to buffer the intermittency of the renewables. So this is an active area of research, and uh, we don't have the, the, the best way to do that, but I can tell you that uh, uh, people are, are, are interested in that, and I think great ideas will, will flow. In post-Fukushima, what are some of the major safety measures being implemented in the designs? Well, if you talk about the Generation 4, you'll see that in, in, in the case of these systems, they're being designed to be passively safe and in some case inherently safe. So passive means that you don't need to have electricity to uh, basically remove the heat. And inherent means uh, you don't need not only do, don't you need uh, uh, electricity to remove the heat, you may not, may not even need the operators to intervene. So th that means that by having these coolants we're able to, that are um, metallic, they're able to remove the heat much quicker, and then we can install passive decay heat removals to reject the heat to the, to the atmosphere, uh, uh, very, various methods. So every one of the systems has their um, own design, but uh, the, the, the recognition that loss of power, which was the you know, principal major issue at uh, Fukushima, the loss of electricity, uh, basically disabled those plants. Uh, that basically is overcome by the Generation 4. Can you con comment on any differences in Generation 4? Well, the FAST systems are all basically designed to uh, uh, burn nuclear waste. So uh, initially, the systems would start with a uranium or uranium-plutonium mix, but over time, uh, used nuclear fuel could be recycled into the fast systems and basically destroying the actinides. Now the importance there is that it, it, it reduces the, um, the time that the radioactive waste is, is, uh, needs, needs to be uh, kept out of uh, human isolation uh, and basically leads to, um, uh, uh, in some cases, a simplified waste management uh, strategy. Okay, then there's a question on D&D &D, uh, and uh, uh, with respect to Generation 4 systems. Uh, I don't think uh, at this point uh, we, we envision the Generation 4 systems of having uh, any kind of uh, major uh, difference in uh, the D&D. &D. I mean, you have uh, basically uh, the need to remove the fuel and the, and the uh, radioactive materials and, and isolate those. But we do have uh, at least uh, some of the designs very interested in how you do that more efficiently. So basically trying to build in the D&D &D into the design to simplify the process when it's needed. Is there any overlap between advanced reactor development and Gen 4 or are these two programs in sync? Well, we kind of use the term uh, advanced reactor for, for Generation 4. I guess uh, there are certainly some light water reactors that are uh, could be considered advanced reactors, but typically when we talk about Generation 4, it's non-water cooled reactors. Uh, and uh, these uh, uh, are basically very distinctive than, from the, than the current generation of reactors that we see around the world. So what do we expect from the new, um, uh, the work that's being done currently on uh, SMRs in terms of uh, regulation? Um, basically, we see the SMRs as paving the way in, in kind of rethinking how uh, reactor technology is, uh, is regulated. Uh, what the advantage of the SMRs in terms of the, the regulatory space is that at least the technology, whether the water cooling, the fuel types, et cetera, are very, are very familiar, so the regulator is co uh, co cognizant of those already. Uh, but the important thing is the, really about the size, the smaller size, the re potential uh, reduction in the source term, the passive cooling. All these are, are basically features that are uh, not seen in the large reactors, and it gives the uh, NRC opportunity to begin to consider uh, how the regulations uh, need to be reinterpreted uh, for the smaller reactor technology. And we're seeing uh, uh, several of these issues already being uh, uh, decided upon by the NRC. And uh, we are very hopeful that the SMR deployments, which we expect in about 10 years or less, uh, to basically pave the way for Generation 4, which will then build on the case made for S um, SMRs. We expect to see uh, any of the designs being uh, 
in, in, implemented into the U.S. fleet, specifically the fast neutron designs? Um, I think uh, the answer is that the uh, utilities are beginning to pay notice to this, and, and in the end it will be a choice of the utilities in terms of which technology uh, they would like to use. Um, uh, Southern Company is uh, currently uh, working on a, a fast uh, molten salt reactor design, so um, you know they they have interest in that technology. So the question is, it, it, it's going to depend on what the utilities want. Uh, from our from the government perspective, we want to make sure that these options are available, and technology sound uh, that the te technology is sound, so the utilities uh, can basically procure these uh, in the 2030 uh, and beyond time frame. Uh, who evaluate which designs are generation four? For example, a lot of uh, so basically what we're uh, we have put together is uh, various uh, methodologies in safety, economics, proliferation risks, etc., that allow us then to quantify the characteristics of the Gen four system. And again, our goal is to have improvement over the Gen three systems. And so it's through that process that we can go through the metrics. Uh, it, it, uh, around our goals and basically uh, come away with a determination that there's improvement. So we're looking for improved systems, and I think that using that uh, kind of uh, analysis and metrics will allow us to make that kind of demonstration. Uh, will there be a session on materials? Uh, I think there is a session later. Uh, in the, Mid to late last next year. I, I don't know if the whole list has been published, but we we are very um, cognizant of the need for materials at high temperatures. So the, again, these reactors are operating at high temperature, and so they need to have uh, steels, for instance, that can operate at those temperatures. And so I think we'll talk about that uh, in in the future. I'm not sure that uh, we have a specific talk on supercritical CO2, but this is certainly one of the research areas within Generation Four. And we can certainly look to include that in a future talk. Will there be a evolution change of the Generation Four International Forum in the future? Um, as I indicated, uh, we recently had an addition of Australia, so the the uh, Generation Forum is is uh, um, in increasing. We're also hearing from some of the original members who are not active, that includes the UK, Argentina, and Brazil, that uh, there may be renewed interest. So as the interest in advanced reactor research grows in countries, we certainly see additional participation. I think within the uh, organization, though, we've recognized the need to do more than just uh, research and development. So this education and training webinar is uh, basically an opportunity to reach out to the public and try to uh, better explain the technology. Uh, we have our efforts with the regulators to basically inform and, and hopefully um, uh, pave the way for regulation of Gen 4 technologies in the future. We're also worried about uh, sustainability and, and trying to develop uh, a methodology to demonstrate sustainability of nuclear systems. So as the program uh, continues, we have uh, very active research but are also looking at many of the other attributes of nuclear power and are uh, trying to address those. And I'm seeing that uh, Dr. Pavier says we do have a uh, supercritical water uh, talk uh, coming up. Yeah, I think uh, I kind of answered this question before. Who will, who will evaluate the designs? The designs are being evaluated based on uh, analysis through method, you know, methodologies that look at the metrics associated with Gen 4. I think uh, in the case of uh, the BA-800, it's uh, the you know, precursor to the Gen 4 system. It really has to do with uh, becoming economically competitive with the current, at least competitive, if not better than the current generation. Uh, what type of safeguards do you expect, and how do Gen 4 address uh, nonproliferation concerns? So this has been an active area of, uh, of uh, uh, analysis since the beginning of the program. We've developed a proliferation uh, risk, physical protection methodology 
that is able to be used and applied to Generation 4 systems to assess their, uh, any potential vulnerabilities. Uh, and so we have brought in the security safeguards experts to uh, do that type of analysis. And I think it's through that that we can uh, basically do safeguards in the design phase or security in the design phase uh, and, and basically uh, minimize any risks associated there. That was a great question and answer um, period. One, oh, more. one more, yep. Yeah, when Gen 4 used metric readouts and measurements, I'm not sure what the question's asking there. But yes, we, we do, again, as I said, we've, we've developed the methodologies that have certain metrics as the output. And uh, the pur purpose of the methodologies is to quantify those, those metrics. Uh, several uh, models are under development. It's probably don't know for certain which one will Well, I think uh, there's certain national interest in, in various designs. For instance, the, the, in terms of the sodium fast reactor in the US, we're primarily interested in uh, metallic fuel core designs. Uh, this is based on experience that we have in development of the metallic fuel. Uh, in Japan uh, uh, and uh, France, the designs are based on oxide fuel because they have the experience in the development of that fuel. Russia is currently using oxide but is testing nitrite fuel. So in some cases, it has to do with the experience within the country on the technology and uh, the desire to further develop that uh, based on their experience. Oh, we're going to use metric system of units over old US. Uh, I Fairly certain that uh, Gen 4 is using uh, the uh, international system of metrics um, uh, since that uh, we, we are an international organization. OK. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sure, Kelly. That was a that was a great um, round of question and answers, um, unlike any that we've seen in in other webinars. That was fantastic. It shows a great level of interest in the from the audience. Um, thanks everyone for attending, Patricia. Thank you for your efforts in pulling this all together. And um, the next I would like to say something before we close. I would like just to invite everybody again uh, to take the survey. It's going to help us. And I invite you to uh, attend the next uh, webinar on the 19th of October, Closing the Fuel Cycle, which will be presented by Professor Young uh, from uh, Republic of Korea. Thank you. Again, thank you, everyone.